since 1968. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. How can I stay healthy when my school doesn't have toilets and there's no clean water to wash my hands? I don't want to get into trouble. I just want somewhere I can play sports or maybe learn to dance or take photos. We are young and we want to be busy. I'm tired of feeling scared. I just want to live my life without fear. Please stand up against violence that hurts us every day. We know that there are lots of things that need to be sorted out in our country. We live with those problems every day, but we know that we are strong. They are strong indeed, and we all need to ensure that they remain strong. Now, keeping children healthy and safe should be every parent's number one priority. Sadly, about 2.3 million children are injured in the home each year. More than 2,500 are killed according to the Center for Disease Control. Now, there are many potential safety hazards kids encounter every day. But arming yourself with the facts and tools to prevent, recognize and know what to do when faced with potential childhood emergencies is crucial. The 2nd November was National Children's Day and today is the second day of the National Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation or CPR week. So today we look at childhood emergencies and CPR in both children and adults. Now what are those common hazards or conditions that may result in medical emergencies? How can we recognize these and prevent them? What do you do when faced with such an emergency in a child? Or how do you handle an adult who just collapses in front of you and stops breathing? Well our expert guests will help us tackle these questions. Now these include a professor of community pediatrics from Vets University, program director for Save the Children South Africa, a Nut Care 91 Emergency Care Practitioner and a Pediatric Nurse from Rahima Musa Hospital. So sit back, relax and learn from this exciting show ahead. Please call us with your questions or views on Johannesburg 714-6841-6842 or 6843. You can also tweet us at SABC Health Talk or simply interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. I'm Dr. Silo Daung and this is Health Talk. Now, children, you know, bring joy and laughter to every family, but, you know, they are vulnerable and need love, care, and protection. As parents and caregivers, we have the responsibility to nurture children so that they grow healthy and strong. Now, to learn more about all of this, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome in our studio, uh, first up, Gugu Kaba. Now, Gugu is the program director for Save the Children South Africa. Welcome to Health Talk, Gugu. Thank you very much, Doc. Okay, and with Google is Professor Harun Saluji. Uh, Prof. Saluji is Head of Com Community Pediatrics at Wirtz University, and uh, he's also Chairperson of the South African Pediatric Association. Welcome to Health Talk. Uh, Thank you. Morning. Thank you. Well, perhaps let me start with you, uh, uh, Google. You know, I, I, in, in my intro, I mentioned the importance you know, of looking after our children, yeah. and, and, and perhaps um, give me your views in terms of, you know, Children's, children's rights when it comes to safety uh, and health, and, and perhaps extend that by telling us a bit about what Save the Children is and what you do. Okay. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, as you indicate, children are the future of all countries, mm -hmm. and uh, children are born out of families, which means as Save the Children, we strongly believe that um, we, pro we provide programs to children based on the rights of children. Children have a right to be loved because they are born of love. Mm. Children have a right to be given education, to be taken care of. Mm. That is why our programs are looking at ensuring that we can provide for the rights of a child. Mm. And the programs ensure that we work with the child herself 
because as you had the children right now, they have a clear voice. They know very well what they need mm -hmm. as children. So we work with children so that we give them a voice for them to help us to be able to help them very well. Mm -hmm. And very importantly, again, we work with parents because um, as you know, our challenges are that we do have parents that plan the pregnancies mm -hmm and are ready to take care of the children. We also have parents that do not plan the pre pregnancy, such that they're not ready to even face what is expected of them in taking care of a child. Mm -hmm. Now they will leave a child unattended. And when a child is unattended, they are at risk, yeah. which means their life is threatened. It could be an injury. It could be someone coming to exploit the child. It could be just when the child is trying to explore, mm -hmm. they fall into an accident. So it's important for children not to be unattended, yeah. taken care of. So, so you talk about parent. I mean, mm -hmm. clearly the biological parents mm -hmm. have the primary responsibility. Mm -hmm. But the concept of parent now in a home situation is probably mm -hmm. different in different communities. Your comment on that? My comment on that is that we say a child needs to be taken care of. Right. And the parent should be somebody that can be responsible to protect the child, to ensure that the child is safe. And you know, we are born of parents, biological and extended families. Mm -hmm. So we need a person to take care of a child who is responsible and is going to make sure that they can be able to support the child to grow well, mm -hmm. you know, to attend to all the needs that the child has. Mm -hmm. Let's get your comment, uh, Professor, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> clearly parental responsibility just in general in looking after children yeah so i mean what's unusual in south africa is that the, the concept of a nuclear family of parents being fathers and mothers is not the case in fact we know most children in this country are being looked after by a, a single mother mm. uh, and in ex substantial amount are looked after by relatives so i think that makes our situation in south africa somewhat different mm. but it doesn't matter who the caregiver of the child is clearly right. the responsibility of looking after children is very heavily dependent on that person or persons. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it doesn't matter what the relationship, a child needs someone who they can, uh, they, they, they know is looking after their needs. Okay. Is that parental responsibility only confined to the home situation, Google? I mean, or does it, does it extend beyond uh, the parents, as it were? How about the community, yes. government? Yeah? No, it extends to, to all the people that are around the child and are responsible, starting from the parent the siblings that are helping the child as the child is growing, the community that is around them, that is relatives and non-relatives, and then into the school where the child spends most, most of their time. Mm -hmm. This includes now the teachers, the counselors, and whoever is within the school environment to help the child grow, including now government, because government cares that schools produ produce Firstly, children can access schools and they can be able to learn good quality learning. And after that, the children must come out ready to contribute to the economy of this country. All right. So. Okay. So, so uh, Prof, despite all of this that we you know, spoke about in terms of you know, uh, parents' responsibility, looking after the children to ensure their you know, health and safety, uh, sometimes there are emergencies that can crop up either in a home environment or outside the home environment. Perhaps you just want to take us through some of the common um, emergencies that you know, we normally encounter. Okay, that's it. So I think that the common ones are, are, are the three following. The commonest uh, injury that children have are usually falls or they get hit. So it's an accident or they've fallen off somewhere. And that, that's one that suddenly a well child suddenly requires uh, urgent care. Mm. The other one is children are by nature very inquisitive and so they always probe in the environment and one of the things they do is they like putting things into the mouth, particularly the little ones. And so ingesting substances, sometimes poison, some s stuff in the household mm -hmm. and then that results in problems. Yeah. And then the third issue that makes an emergency is medical conditions. So unfortunately yeah. we still have infections. So suddenly a child develops pneumonia that becomes very serious yeah. or has diarrhea and becomes very dehydrated yeah. uh, or suddenly has a fever and that becomes more complicated. So those are the kind yeah. of things we see. Okay, we're also going to go a little deeper into this, but let's just go back to the physical injuries now and, and perhaps look a, lit, a lot deeper into the causes of such. Um, in your opinion, what, what are the yeah. common causes? So th there's common stuff and the stuff that are really dangerous and, and, and kill children. Yeah. So common stuff is children often fall, they often injure, they, they, they may have uh, wounds, they, scrapes, they might have broken bones. Yeah. And we see a lot of that. But most of those are not emergencies. Right. The real emergencies in that area is, is in fact accidents and children in accidents is mainly pedestrians. About 80% yeah. of 
accidents in children up a distance. So it's children walking in the street, uh, going to school, yeah. uh, and, and, and get knocked in. And, and that perhaps is the big emergency because that can be uh, very serious from head injuries yeah. to broken bones. Yeah. It's uh, interesting you mentioned the, the, the issue of this being an emergency, this not being an emergency. Now, in a child, what constitutes a medical emergency? What, what are those things that when parents see, they must suddenly say, hey, this is an emergency, I need to act? Yeah, so obviously when children get ill, for most parents, this is an emergency. But there are yeah. some things that parents must recognize. And there's perhaps a few, uh, maybe five or six signs, what we call danger signs, that parents should recognize. So the first issue is children who stop eating and stop breastfeeding, that's a serious issue. A child should be eating. Even when they're sick, they may not want to eat, but they stop feeding. The next one is a child who vomits everything. That's a serious problem. There's something going on. And then another important thing is when children aren't themselves. So when they start becoming drowsy or not arousable or, or, or in fact get unconscious, that's a serious sign. And mm -hmm. all parents, most parents will recognize that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another one we pick up is in fact when children has a fit. Uh, yeah. So that we recognize. So those are the four danger signs we talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and if parents recognize any of those, uh, that's suggesting that my child needs something. There's a few others that we... Uh, we consider as well, but yeah. those are not as important. If parents recognize these four things, yeah. I think th those are real emergencies. Yeah. So, so not, not a, a, a cough in the middle of the night that's irritating the father. That's not emer an emergency that you know, the child should be taken to the hospital, <laughs> yeah. is that so? Yeah, but obviously the, the, the father that's an emergency, he's not sleeping. No, but I think, and that's the problem for parents, is you're not yeah. always clear what's an emergency and what's not. Yeah. And hopefully the show today will perhaps take it a bit further to say this is serious, this yeah. isn't. Okay. Kugu, perhaps you, you, let me get your final word on this. I mean, clearly, sometimes injuries, mm -hmm. uh, you know, children don't go out to, you know, seek to be injured and that sort of thing. And, and we're seeing um, a lot of, you know, uh, injuries that affect children. Your final word in terms of what parents really should be doing to ensure that, you know, they keep their children safe. Okay. Parents should help us by taking a responsibility mm. of being around the child almost 100% of the time. Mm. As we said, children explore. So if there's no one to assist the child to navigate whatever games they are playing, mm. the child is likely to fall into an accident. So mm. my view is that parents should understand they have a full responsibility, they should be around mm. and provide the assistance the child needs to grow. All right. Well, Taba, Program Director, Save the Children South Africa, thank you so much for your contribution. Okay, we're going to go for a quick commercial break. After the break, we're now zoned into the home environment now. Please stay with us. Embracing our members in good health since 1968. MedShield Medical Scheme. We don't just talk health, we do health. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. What is the price of ambition? Early mornings? Late nights? Or sacrificing the little things now for bigger things tomorrow? Ambitious people are all made of the same stuff. Big dreams, big dedication, and a big attitude. With an understanding that sometimes to get ahead in life, you need a helping hand from those a little bigger than you. For home, for business, for life. Macro. Big on life. Shield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill. We'll help you stay well. Welcome back. Now, a home is a place where children feel safe. But, you know, but, you know, with their inquisitive and exploring minds, a home can be a hazard. Now, the good news is that parents can protect toddlers and small children from harm. But this is just part of what we're going to be talking about today. You know, we're looking at the home environment and some of the medical emergencies that are common in the home environment. 
And to help us with this, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Sister Yanni Yoste. Now, Sister Yost is a pediatric nurse based at Rahima Musa Hospital. Welcome to Health Talk, Sister. Thank you, Doctor, right. and welcome to the U.S. All right, and, and of course, we still have Prof. Harun Saluji, uh, Head of Community Pediatrics at Wurz University. Now, perhaps let's start with you, uh, uh, Prof. We, we started talking about, obviously, uh, common kind of, you know, emergencies that we, we encounter, but in a home environment now. Um, perhaps let's go back to those three categories. Let's start with the physical um, injuries that may be common in a home environment. Some of them we may have touched on, but we just go a little deeper into that, yeah? Yeah, so the, the one of the commonest ones that we see is in fact related to burns. Burns, yeah. uh, and, and the burns we see usually are related to water in our settings. About 70% of them are hot water, often on a, um, a steaming water, or a child pulls something off the stove, and, right. and that's the one we often have to deal with. Yeah. Um, okay, let's stay, stay on order because I, what I'd like us to do, obviously we, for whatever we talk about, we, we need to say, okay, what, what causes this and how can parents avoid or prevent this from happening? And perhaps the most important thing is what to do when it happens. Okay, so clearly Ben's is, they leave boiling water around, sister? Yeah? Very, very common, uh, uh, doctor. In this instance, I'll say parents must avoid carrying the baby when they are busy executing chores in the house because the child is at the level and they can pull off right. the things. And uh, <laughs> also okay. they, um, they mustn't put uh, like uh, tablecloths on the tables because when a cup is there with the tea or something, the child can pull it off and that is how they sustain all these burns and scalds. When they run water, they must not run hot water first, they must first run cold water and then the hot water in a bath. Right. And never, ever leave a child in a bath without attending. And mm. parents must be very careful because we get so quickly distracted yeah. leaving the child unattended. An ordinary bucket of water, mm. a child can um, also get injured in that. This may sound like common sense, but, but oftentimes, you know, accidents do happen. So when an accident does happen then, Prof, um, what should parents do? Now, now, clearly, we must define what is an emergency that must be taken to hospital and what shouldn't be taken to hospital when it comes to bends and, and what people should do. You know, you hear of smearing toothpaste or sunlight soap on bends and that sort of thing, yeah? All right. So, obviously, a, a child getting burnt is, is, a, is, is a major shock for parents. And so, most parents want to do something. And as you rightly point out, there's a few things that you shouldn't do. So, let's start out with those. So, you want to do something. What you shouldn't do is put unnecessary stuff onto this burn. And so that will include often f common things are toothpaste are popular, uh, petroleum jelly or Vaseline is very popular. And the message is very clear, don't put anything immediately. And what you should do is put it under running water, or if you haven't got running water, into a bucket of water for at least about 10 minutes because cooling it significantly helps reduce the extent of the burn. The problem with putting things like Colgate is that it then keeps the heat in the burn and actually makes the burn worse. Mm. So that's the, the, perhaps the single most important message is don't put anything in and try and cool it down. Um, and then the next step, of course, is that you have to decide how serious it is. And the message we usually give is about a five cent coin. So if it's bigger than a five, if it's under a five cent coin, that's a small burn. You can manage it at home. Uh, usually just covering it will be fine. But if it's bigger than that, then usually a child needs care. Doesn't what matter where it is. Yeah, so again, that's quite important. So obviously anything that's on the face, we would be much more concerned about. Um, the rest of the body is, is less of a concern. Sometimes we worry more about, about fingers, but mm. the face is the one area that even if it's a smaller burn, you might want to take the child to a clinical hospital. Okay. And then the key thing is not to put things on the burn. So either you, you, you put a, a nothing fluffy, something like a cotton cloth, or even if you've got the, the kitchen, the plastic wrap, you can put a plastic wrap, but that's it. Yeah. And the last thing is that if there is something on the burnt clothes or anything that is stuck, don't try and take it off. Rather take the child to the hospital. As it is. And then the last thing you can do is the child really is screaming and you might want to give a, a, a dose of paracetamol or so-called panado just to calm the child. And that's probably it. That, right. that, if that's done, that's the essential first steps. Okay. Sister, let's move away to, to other, you know, common stuff that we often see. You know, children tend to, you know, yes. experiment with things and they will take whatever into their mouths. And sometimes as parents, we go and buy paraffin. Uh, yes. You know, we put paraffin in a, in a two-liter cool drink bottle and, and the child ingests that. 
I mean, paraffin is just but one of them. Any other common things that uh, perhaps children accidentally ingest? Medi medication. Right. The parents must keep all medication out of the reach of children. And a thing that I would like to emphasize to parents is when they bring their children to the hospital, to be open and honest as to what the child has ingested. If they don't know, if they know they can bring whatever medication it is, if not, uh, whatever vomit is, the child has vomit, they can bring that along and we can determine from that what are the possible things. Because we find like rat poisoning, insecticides and all those things very important and when they come in it's normally very serious. So the important thing is to try and keep those out of reach of children. Out of reach of children. Very, right. very important. All right. So Prof, let's talk about then, you know, in, in terms of accidental poisoning. What should parents do in terms of, you know, how should they recognize that this is, this is, this is a problem and, and what should they do? Okay, so how will you know that your child has had taken something that might be a poison, even something in the household? And often you may not know it, you may find some bottle lying around, but there are sometimes symptoms. And the kind of symptoms you'll see is the ones that you would worry about is the child perhaps starts becoming a little bit drowsy or is not as playful as always, that's suggested. Uh, some poisons affect the breathing. So you, some, paraffin is a good example. The child starts breathing very fast. Some poisons like the insecticides, the child will start salivating, drooling. You may come of, of stomach pain. So there's a, a few symptoms. But if a child is behaving differently and you see something, you sh that's the first thing. And then there's a few key messages of what to do and what to do. What, what most people like in our setting is to give milk. Mm. And the question is, is milk good or bad? And increasingly we say, is if a child's taken something, we prefer not to give anything. In the old days, people liked to give syrup to cause a child to vomit, that if the child's taken a less vomit, we actually don't, we prefer not that. Because it depends what you, there's a lots of different things you can take and you're not always sure. But vomiting is not a good, so vomiting is not a good idea. Milk, in some situations where perhaps you've taken to dilute it is not the worst possible thing, but we don't encourage. We prefer you take nothing, and then, depending on if the child's got these symptoms, to bring the child to the clinic. Mm -hmm. The other resource you have is that we have poison centers in the country. So mm -hmm. if you know what it is, you can phone the poison center and say, my child has taken these tablets, what must I do? And mm -hmm. you'll get advice. But if you're not sure, and you see any of these signs, take the child to the hospital, and the, the hospital will deal where, with it. Where can people find the telephone numbers for poison centers? Okay, so. I, I mean, obviously, you've got internet. That's the easiest way you can get it on the cell phone. It's oh. in the telephone directory as well. Okay. And those are the two ways okay. you'd get but it. We'll, we'll, we'll give out some emergency numbers at the end. Now, sister, before we finish this, uh, it's important to talk about illnesses. All right, children do get ill, and uh, we need to, you know, determine whether or not some are emergencies and some people can, can you know, deal with quite effectively at home. Now, let's talk diarrhea, for instance. Yeah, diarrhea is one of the very uh, most commonest ones that we see. Unfortunately, people don't bring them in on time. But we also don't say just bring the child in because he had one loose stool. There are things that the parents can do at home yeah, to right. rehydrate the child. Okay. So if a child is having diarrhea, what they can do is they can um, mix up a quarter, half a teaspoon of salt with uh, eight teaspoons of sugar and in one liter of water, boiled cold water, or if the water is clean, they can just mix it like that, and they can frequently give that. If the, uh, the diarrhea continues, it doesn't matter as long as the child is retaining that fluid. But if the child does not retain the fluid and starts vomiting, then it is very important for them to then bring the child to the hospital. Mm. The critical signs is again when the child starts becoming very floppy, lethargic, the eyes are not sunken, mm. and the mucus is dry, even if the child is crying and there's no tears coming out, those are signs that the child is now dehydrated. We yeah. prefer them then to bring the child to the hospital. Before we go for a break quickly, uh, children do get respiratory tract infections and pneumonias and asthmas and that sort of thing. What are the signs that parents should look out for as you know, emergencies? Okay, so the, the sign of pneumonia that we look for is fast breathing, but parents don't, but a child is breathing very fast, and I'm not going to give you, if, if you're noticing very fast, that's a sign that the child might have pneumonia. But the, 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 the sign parents need to do is that if the child looks like he's really struggling or she's really struggling, that's a sign that this is getting worse, okay. or they might start making noises. Yeah. And those two are noises or lots of struggling means take the child to the clinic or oh. the hospital. Yeah. Maybe it's on this point that we need to 
just break. We'll continue our discussion afterwards. So after the break, we continue our discussion on emergencies, but this time focus on situations away from home. Please stay with us. Shield Medical Scheme. We don't just talk health, we do health. What is the price of ambition? Early mornings, late nights, or sacrificing the little things now for bigger things tomorrow? Ambitious people are all made of the same stuff. Big dreams, big dedication, and a big attitude. With an understanding that sometimes to get ahead in life, you need a helping hand from those a little bigger than you. For home, for business, for life. Macro. Big on life. Shield. Embracing our members in good health since 1968. Welcome back. We're talking childhood emergencies. Now, the responsibility of looking after the children is not only confined to the home environment, but extends beyond. Now, children also spend quite a fair amount of time at school and elsewhere. Now, to tell us more about this, I still have my guest, Sister Yanni Yost, pediatric nurse uh, based at Rahima Musa Hospital, and Prof. Harun Saluji, a head of co community pediatrics at Wurz University. Now, we're talking just now about you know, obviously some of those medical images. Perhaps let's continue with you, Prof. Um, quite often parents feel that the child is hot or the child has fever. Okay, what should parents do at that point? All right, so fever is not an infrequent syndrome. And the question really is, uh, how is it affecting the child? So yeah. children can have quite high fever. So fever we usually say is more than 37.5 degrees Celsius. Right. Some people have got thermometers of all kinds at home. Some people don't. Some people just say the child feel hot. But whatever it is, if the child is hot, and the message perhaps is that if the child is hot but he's doing the normal things, playing, running, eating, and even though he, he or she has got a temperature, it actually doesn't make a big difference. Right. When, as we said before, you worry with the fever is when the child starts becoming lethargic, doesn't want to eat, is vomiting, or worse still has a fit. Do children with fever automatically need medicines? Do they need to get uh, paracetamol or what have you? The answer is again, no. There's no clear need for, for that. Uh, but if the fever is very, very high, and usually very high means more than about 38.5, that most parents will want to give some, uh, some, some, something for it. Okay. What about other measures like, you know, getting the clothes off, uh, putting the child next to your fan and... So we used to put a lot of reliance. I remember when I was a younger doctor, I used to take these kids and put them in a cold bath and the poor kids. A lot of that the evidence doesn't show anymore. So there's very little evidence for putting into a bath, even tippet sponging, in other words, taking something. And yeah. it's, 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 it's fine, ex except it has a danger. You actually make the child cold, make him shiver and generate more heat. So mm -hmm. the short answer is putting on fans and, and putting in cold water is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Taking off the shirt might be reasonable. Mm -hmm. have cooling, taking off clothing is a good idea. But that's about it. You don't have to get too excited. And when they bring their children over to you, should they be wrapping them up in warm blankets? <laughs> okay, so you've seen that, and obviously that's the worst <laughs> thing. You, you think you've got a hot child, the child's sick, wrap him up more. That's the worst thing, particularly the little ones. I've seen under three months. So, yes, let, let, let them be exposed, but don't get too excited. Fever is not going to kill you. The one thing that it does do sometimes, and we recognize it, that children can have a convulsion, a fit, yeah. from being too hot. Okay. And let's sometimes take, you have to deal with that. Let's take that convulsion story, sister in a school environment. Oftentimes when a child you know, collapses and starts having fits, uh, everybody gets scared. The che teachers, uh, well, maybe not so much the teachers, <laughs> but other kids you know, obviously will get scared and they will call the teacher. What should people do when they see someone having a fit? Yeah, it's a very good thing. The act itself is very frightening compared to the cause of what the cause. Yeah. So very important is to make sure that, that uh, in that process there's nothing that could injure 
the child at that moment. So such a child should be taken away from safety. And uh, they must not give anything at that stage orally. Because people tend to think when they give something the child, it, the child can choke and then it will just aggravate the whole situation. So such a child must, even after the incident has happened, it's advisable that they must seek medical care because we must find out the cause of it. Okay. What are the things that they shouldn't do when, when they have a child with fits? They, there's often... Yeah, so there's, there's a few concepts. What I, people notice, people try and stop the fits and hold the child. That's yeah. not a good idea. Leave yeah. the child alone. Ideally, turn the child on the side. The other thing people have learned is that you must put something in the mouth to try and prevent biting. Bad idea. Yeah. Okay, because that's actually the worst thing you can do. So it's actually what you shouldn't do. The ideal is leave the child or an adult, let them have the fit and put them on the side. You don't want them to vomit, but that's it. Don't try and do things because that's not necessary. Yeah. Staying at a school, I mean, oftentimes, you know, parents will get calls from the teachers that your child is sick. What should constitute a medical emergency at school that you know, teachers should do something about? Yeah. So there's a few things that the teachers... So obviously if there's been a, a fall and the child perhaps has lost consciousness or the child is feeling drowsy, that's an emergency, whether it's at home or at school, uh, or if he's broken an arm. So if it's a serious injury, the teachers will recognize it. But the children go to school with medical conditions, and the three common ones are uh, what we've just talked about, epilepsy, and then there's children, asthma is very common. One out of eight child, so children go to, with asthma and the other one is diabetes. And very briefly, those are the ones teachers need to recognize. So the fit we've talked about, if a child has an asthma, and often at school it's because a child has exercise and may not have taken this inhaler that they normally have. And the idea there is that parents need to, uh, the teachers need to recognize that. Obviously, if the child's got the inhaler, give it to him. But if it's getting on and getting worse, that would be a need to call the parents. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, perhaps Sister Yester wants to talk about, is that she sees and is, is children who are diabetic and then have problems at school. Right. Sister? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think what should happen is a teacher should be informed if a child is having a medical condition, especially Correct. like the diabetes. Yeah. We see a lot of them coming in with hypoglycemic comas, and that is a very serious condition, so they need to get to the hospital as soon as possible. Mm. But preferably, like I said, teachers should actually have some knowledge as to if such a child is in the class, mm. you know, what are the symptoms, they become drowsy and uh, such things. So then they need to inform the parents and see that the child gets to a medical facility. Okay. I know that there's also a, an issue around the fact that, you know, teachers aren't allowed to administer medication to children um, in some instances. But should, in those instances where, let's say, a child is known to have diabetes and feels a little drowsy, should the teacher be giving anything, even if it's not medication? Should they do anything or should they just take the child to hospital? No, they should take the child to the hospital. In fact, what we do now with the bigger children, they get a very informed. They are told about their condition, what they must do and what they mustn't do. Right. So normally the children will know what is the thing that they need to do. Okay. Physical injuries are common in a school environment. Oftentimes, you know, children come with cuts and uh, bleeds and so on. How should teachers at a school, uh, you know, approach a child with a small bleed? A small be <laughs> bleed is it's not... Uh, such a difficult thing. It is a very alarming thing, but preferably they must put a compression on there. And the, I would like to advise all schools must have a first aid kit, and then the teachers, uh, I mean, everybody should be educated as to how to manage a little incident at school. Yeah. So they can just cover it up, uh, put pressure on there, and take the child to the nearest clinic. Okay. Of course, I mean, people are scared of seeing blood. Uh, you know, what should constitute an emergency in that situation to say? Okay, so whether it's at school or at home, I think that the key message is if any child's bleeding, the first thing is just to, to put some of pressure on it. And ideally, you do it with some, a clean cloth. Uh, if you don't have a clean cloth, you can even just use your fingers to put pressure on it. And uh, usually the limit is about 10 minutes. Most bleeding will stop. There's some parts of the body where it bleeds more. So if you get hurt on the scalp, on the, on the, on the head, you're more likely to bleed. Or, 
But the idea is just to put pressure. And, and about most instances, it will stop within 10 minutes. If after 10 minutes you can't control it, then that would be the reason the teacher would have to call the parent or at home. Mm. You'd say you'd have to get to clinic. But I think people, as Sister Yusuf says, people get excited. But compression will co control most bleeds. Mm. And just the other point about wounds. The, the, the message is very clear. You don't have to clean wounds. Or just cleaning with pure water is good enough in most instances if a child's fallen. You don't have to even put the fancy antiseptics. The evidence is that pure water is fine. So clean a wound with water. If it's bleeding, put some pressure and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, so, some kids, you know, would also have uh, something a bit more than just bleeding. They might fracture or dislocate a joint. What should you know, teachers or any, anybody around there do? So again, how will you know a fracture? Uh, you may not know it. Sometimes it's very obvious, but most times it's going to be a child who's obviously in pain, a child who's crying, whether at home or at school. And sometimes it's obvious that something is... And the message again is very clear, that you shouldn't be trying to reduce it or, or put it back in place or what have you. All you do, if you've got, you can try and create a little sling just to make sure it doesn't move. But even if you don't have a sling, the main idea is to... to, to, to to, to hold it, to keep it firm, and, and take the child to the clinic. There's no need to start meddling and trying to fix it. Yeah. Sure. It's been such an informative chat. I wish we just had a bit more time than we normally do. But anyway, um, Prof. Harun Saluji, Head of Community Pediatrics at Vets University and Chairperson of the South African um, the, the Pediatric Association, and of course, Sister Yadi Yost, Pediatric Nurse at Rahima Musa Hospital. Thank you so much for your insight into this. All right, we're going to go for a break. After the break, we now learn how to recognize that cardiac emergency in a child and what to do instead of just running away. Stay with us. If we are talking health, then let's talk seriously. It's so good, nothing else can replace Just your slightest embrace And if you only would Be my own For the rest of my day I will whisper this phrase, my darling Ceci Pong. What is the price of ambition? Early mornings, late nights, or sacrificing the little things now for bigger things tomorrow? Ambitious people are all made of the same stuff. Big dreams, big dedication, and a big attitude. With an understanding that sometimes, to get ahead in life, you need a helping hand from those a little bigger than you. For home, for business, for life. Macro. Big on life. MedShield Medical Scheme. We don't just talk health, we do health. Welcome back. Now, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR for short, is a life-saving technique that all of us need to be familiar with. But certainly, this is not often the case. Now, here to tell us more about what this is, is Judy Stain. Now, Judy is an emergency care practitioner from NetCare 91. Welcome to Health Talk, Judy. Thank you very much. All right. I know that you'll take us through uh, the process, but let's just talk about CPR. What is CPR? That's a difficult word to... You know, people find it easier to just say CPR or not. Yeah. I think CPR is a better way to explain it. Everybody knows what you're talking about if you use the abbreviation CPR. Yeah. Um, so what CPR is, is um, when a patient collapses, a lot of the time the heart stops beating. Yeah. So in that little interim when the heart is no longer beating, you, um, as a person who can recognize that, you can artificially massage the heart, which is what we do when we do those chest compressions on the patient's chest. Right. So during that time, we're artificially, st artificially still pumping some blood around the patient's body, still providing some oxygen to the brain and to the heart to try and keep that patient alive. Okay, all right. Now, okay, before we talk about CPR, obviously one needs to recognize that this is a situation that requires CPR. Yes. Okay. Let's perhaps, because we've been talking about children, let's start with children. 
okay. common thing is, is drowning, you know, or near drowning, let's call it that. So it's actually quite easy um, across all age groups of patients, so whether it's a child, an adult, a small baby, to recognize if the patient may or may not be in what we call cardiac arrest. So um, it's sometimes very difficult to try and feel if a patient has a pulse, so we no longer do that. So yeah. if you get to a patient, somebody's collapsed, a child has just been taken out of a pool where they've maybe been submerged in the water, all that you need to do is you need to follow a process, um, and we all know the alphabet, so it's A, B, and C. So we want to first see if the child is awake or the adult, if the person is awake. And then the second thing we want to look at is, are they breathing? So if they're not a break, awake, if they're not breathing, we want to call for help. Right. So awake and breathing, that's the only two things. If neither of those are present, we want to immediately initiate the emergency care, which is then the CPR. Okay. I mean, at that time, obviously, this person would be collapsed, lying on the floor. Yes, most right. likely. So, so what then do you do? Um, so you've now recognized that the patient is not awake, the patient is not breathing, so you're going to call for help. So emergency number 082911, you can call for help. You can even just call for help um, for people around you. Maybe there's somebody around that knows first aid, maybe there's somebody with a medical qualification, and you can ask for them to call for help. Mm -hmm. Then once you've called for help, you will approach the patient and uh, you will then initiate the steps of resuscitation. Okay, so take us through the steps then. How do you... Where do you start? Okay, so for the resuscitation, there's a few things that's important that we need to remember. So we want to now um, put our hands onto the patient's chest and we want to now compress this patient's heart compress the patient's chest. So the, the area that we're looking for is the breastbone, or yeah. the, the medical term is called the sternum. So, so what is the action of compressing the chest do, actually? What, what are you trying to do by doing that? So what you're trying to do is the, the heart is located a almost in the middle of the chest, slightly towards the left. So what we're doing is we're compressing the heart between the breastbone and between the spine. So we're compressing the heart to try and push the blood out so that the blood can continue to circulate around the patient's okay. body. So we're artificially pumping the patient's heart by compressing it between between those two bones. Okay, and I believe there's a particular way in which you do it. Yes, there is. So I'm okay. going to I'm going to show that. I'm going to start by showing it on the adult patient. So we've okay. now recognised that this adult is not awake and this adult is not breathing. Right. So we want to get down to the patient. If they are wearing any clothes, you want to remove that. Remove the clothes, um, and then you want to identify the breastbone, so the bone in the um, in the middle of the chest. You want to place the palm of your one hand in the middle, slightly towards the bottom of that breastbone. You want to place the other hand over that. You want to get your body weight over the patient's chest, and you just want to push down as hard and as fast as you can. So we want to achieve this by pressing down 100 to 120 times in a minute. Sure. Now, how do you count 120 times in one minute? So, so is it important to, to get that rate or how, so how that, do you do that it? That is yeah? the optimal date rate that we want to try and achieve. But if it's something that you're going to be doing for the first time, you doing this is going to be increase that patient's chance of survival rather than you just standing there waiting for help to arrive. Mm -hmm. So what we try and emphasize, if you can push really hard and if you can push really fast. Mm -hmm. So we want to try and push an adult patient's chest about five to six centimeters. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're not going to stand there with a ruler to try and measure it. Mm -hmm. So just remember, if you can push really hard and if you can push really fast, okay. then you will increase that patient's chance of survival. Right. Okay. So what you want to be doing is you want to provide 30 of these compressions. Yeah. Um, so, so, so you're saying that you need to be pushing with the palm of your the hand? The palm of the hand, And yes. you need to... Uh, your elbows, do you need to straighten them? The elbows should be locked out. So we want to keep the elbows in a locked out position. We want to get the shoulders over the patient's body. It is quite tiring. So we want to try and use as much of the upper body strength to provide these compressions as good as possible. Right, right. Okay. Um, if you have a barrier device, so something that you can provide breath through, sometimes you might get to somebody that you don't know. It's somebody in a shopping center. So people sometimes are a bit hesitant to put their mouth over a stranger's mouth. Yeah, it's good that so you talk about that because... You know, this is the question of saying, okay, in which situations is mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing crucial? And at what point do you start? Because so, I believe there's differences, isn't that so? Yeah, so once you've started, you've um, initiated the compressions on the patient's chest, you want to do 30 of those compressions, and then you want to provide the patient with two breaths. Right. So if you do have a barrier device, so you, you get the um, what we call a pocket mask, and then you get your regular, just a little barrier device that you can use that are normally available in all 
in all first aid kits. So it's just a little device that provides some sort of barrier between your mouth and that patient's mouth. Mm. If you do have these things, then it is advisable to provide the breaths from early on in the resuscitation. Mm. However, if you do not have any of these devices, instead of performing no emergency care on the patient, it's better to do the compressions only. Yeah. So then you're going to just do the compressions at 100 to 120 beats um, in a minute, and you then do not have to do the breaths. And how long do you carry on doing all of this, compressing? Um, it is quite tiring. So if you as the rescuer at all become fatigued or you feel that you are now putting yourself in danger, then you may stop. Um, otherwise, um, you want to continue to do this until help arrives. Okay. So that help that you called after A, B and C, until that help arrives, you want to continue to provide the resuscitation. And, and the important thing is that anybody can do this. Anybody can do this. You don't have to be trained. You don't have to be to be an emergency care practitioner like yourself no, to be not able at to all. do this. Anybody can do this. If you can um, recognize whether the patient is awake, if they're breathing, if neither of those are present, you want to call for help and you want to start with the chest compressions. Okay. So how then do you do, let's say you don't have any of these barrier devices, okay. you need to have two blows into the mouth. How do you do it? Um, so if you don't have the barrier device, we're not going to blow into the okay. patient's mouth. We're just going to perform the chest compressions. If you mm. do have the barrier device, I can demonstrate how to do that. Okay. So this goes into the patient's mouth. So we're going to start by doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. 3, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Once you just tilt the patient's head back, you want to put your mouth entirely over the patient's mouth. You okay. want to see that the chest rises. Great. And then you great. continue with the compressions again. All right. Um, before we come back, because I wanted us to talk about the AED. Yes. But, but before that, with the child, I mean, do you... Yeah. Do you change the manner in which you do things? Uh, so for a, um, for a, a child, it's like a school age child, you will do it exactly the same as you do for an adult. If it's a smaller child or if you're a very, lo very large person that's doing the compressions, you can simply just use only one arm instead of using the two hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, if it, is an, if it is an infant or a small child, then you want to use only two fingers. So any child under the age of one years old, you want to also identify the, the breastbone, find the lower half of the breastbone, and what you're going to do is you're simply just going to press using two fingers. Mm -hmm. And you follow the same process where you perform the 30 chest compressions and then you can do the two ventilations. Okay. What about somebody who vomits in the process? Uh, somebody who vomits in the process, um, obviously then if you don't have the barrier devices you will not um, risk yourself by putting your mouth into, over the patient's mouth. Um, at the time, performing the chest compressions for the heart that's not beating is more important than the patient that might have some of the um, content of the vomit that remains in the patient's mouth. So while the compressions or the CPI is ongoing, you want to, you want, you can, you want to basically ignore the vomitus. You can try okay. and clean it out of the patient's mouth, but we don't want to interrupt this to turn the patients on the side or anything like that. All right. Now let's come back to the adult now. You, okay. You've been pushing this and uh, somebody comes running to say there's something called an AED that I saw. What is this AED and how does it work? Okay, that will be amazing if someone does bring you an AED. <laughs> <laughs> so normally when the, when the heart stops beating, the heart doesn't only have a, me a mechanical contraction, it also has some electrical activity. Mm. So we want to try and restart that electrical activity in the heart and we achieve that by using this device. And where so, can people find this device? Um, this device is normally found in majority of public places. So in all gyms, in airports, in big shopping centers, by a security office or at a first aid room, all of these devices should be available. So and you it can, will be written clearly AED. It will be clearly marked. It will normally be stuck on a wall. Um, and as soon as the, the, the device is removed, then an alarm sounds. So people are then made aware that an emergency is present. Okay, we have about one minute. Just take okay. us through how it works. It's very easy to work, and I don't want people to be afraid to use it. Yeah. Um, it's, got, it's numbered one, two, and three. So you switch it on. And this device will tell you what to do. So you simply follow the voice prompts. So it says we should apply the pads to the bare chest. So we don't want to put it over clothing. It's marked where the, the, the pad should go. 
So the one goes next to the breastbone on the right hand side and the other one goes on the left hand side um, on the side of the patient's uh, body and then you want to plug it in. So it will tell you that it's analyzing and that you should not touch the patient. During this time, you will not continue with the compressions and it now tells you that a shock is advised. Stay clear of patients. Deliver shock now. Press the orange button. So there's an orange, orange light that starts flashing. You simply make sure that nobody is touching the patient and you shock. press the button. And it tells you the shock has been delivered and immediately you will continue with the CPR. Mm. And this is what might save a life, basically. This will definitely, if you can recognize it, provide the chest compressions, find an AED and use one, call for the appropriate help, you definitely can and save a life. And you don't need any special training for this. Anybody can do this. If you are willing to do it, you can save a life. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Judy Stein, emergency practitioner from, uh, emergency care practitioner from NetCare 91. Okay. Now, every second, as you heard, folks, counts in an emergency. And to have emergency services numbers in one place, means that you prepare to take any event. Now, take this down, please. Any emergency, just from your cell phone, call 112 to call for an ambulance, 10177, or NetCare 911, or for a fire, uh, 10177, or Flying Squad, as you all know, 10 triple now, 10 triple one rather, sorry. It's on that note that we come to the end of our show today. And remember that uh, you can join us next week, same time. SABC News, and please remember to share your views and comments with us via our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk, and follow us on Twitter at SABC Health Talk. Now, repeats of this show are every Saturday at 2 p.m. and Thursday at 5 a.m. I'm Dr. Salomon Dong. Thank you so much for watching, and please do take care.